up in Maine, God bless you. And all those that are here tonight, God bless you. Well, I'm excited to hear what Brother Moffat has to say. It's been a couple of years since we've seen him here. I've seen him a couple of times before, you know, in the family. But uh, it's good to have him all with us. Amen. So, Brother James, won't you please come and take your liberty tonight? Yeah, she said there's water there for you if you need one. God bless you, my friend. Bring my family up for just a second. I'd like to have uh, my rose garden. If they would come up here, please, and just uh, say hi to the people. Would everybody come? Yeah. You know, I was 50 years old and unmarried. 50 years old, never married, and I prayed. Just shows you've got to be careful what you pray for. I prayed and I said, God, I, I need a wife. You know, God, I'm, I'm not getting any younger. And he brought me a wife and then he brought me four girls. And I got to tell you, those of you who are fathers of boys, you got the easy job. It's a lot harder to be a father to girls, and especially when you got a lot of them. So uh, I'd like to have my wife introduce the girls and herself. Well, it's wonderful to be back here. We really are blessed. It's family, your family, and a lot of your faces I know, and of course, pastor's sister. We just love, we love them. We had a chance to see them in Phoenix, so we're kind of blessed to hog them a little bit away from you guys. As you know, I'm Lorna, and then go ahead with your name. Uh, my name is Alana. Uh, my name is Alyssa. These are twins, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Those were the baby twins we started off with. Jayla. Jayla. Jenna. Jayla and Jenna. And then we stopped. <laughs> that was more than enough. Uh, the scriptures, hello there, Edith. <laughs> Scriptures say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I just feel like God's presence is here. There's a hungry here, a hunger, hungriness. I don't know if that's a word. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? I just feel like we're being filled afresh and anew when we needed that, didn't we? Because, you know, Sunday, Monday, or whatever it is, or your Bible study, it's just it's not enough. And I feel like I'm being filled tonight. So I pray even more so as we hear the word that you'll be just totally filled up as you leave this place. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. That must be New England speak. Hungriness. Hungriness. I... <laughs> well, uh, if we could have the PPT up there. Before, before I get into the message today, I want to tell you a little bit about China. I've been quite a few years since I've actually been here. In fact, the last time that I was here, I did John over in the other, uh, in the other uh, place where you were, across the hallway there. So this is actually my first time uh, in this, uh, in this uh, sanctuary here. And I want to tell you something. I love it. I really feel the presence of the Lord you have a great sanctuary. You have a great pastor. Don't tell him I said so. You have, a great, you have a great first lady, and we really enjoy it when we get a chance to spend time with you. And I actually remember a lot of your faces. So it's and at my age to remember people, that's doing pretty good. But it's very nice to be back here. Um, I, uh, I still go to China at least two times a year. Uh, last year I went and it was a very difficult time because the government had curtailed a lot of things. They stopped, stopped us from doing almost anything. Uh, this year in March I went and things were, things were better. Uh, I was able to accomplish quite a bit. In fact, more than 50 people gave their hearts to the Lord within that three-week period of time. And so that's a great, a great um, thing. Last September when I went, I always do baptisms and we go out into the sea to do them. And usually there's 150 to 200 people, but the government had given them such a hard time that we had to hide inside the church in a little baptismal they had there. And we only had 60 people baptized. It's, it's the first time, I mean, I've baptized 25 
hundred people in that church. It's the first time that the number has been 60 people. I, I didn't know what to do with such few people. I, I said, Lord, what's going on here? Well, the government was controlling a lot of things. Now, I've heard from, I'm, 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 Lord willing, I'll be going back in August, and I've heard from the pastor in China that the, the um, government, again, is giving them difficulties. They've insisted that they put in CCTV cameras, closed-circuit television cameras, so that the government can watch who's coming and who's going. And they've been ordered not to allow any foreigners in there to speak. Since I'm Chinese, I, I guess I'm okay. I lived there for 20 years. Doesn't that make me Chinese? I think that makes me Chinese. I don't know. But no, I'm not supposed to speak there. Uh, I'm scheduled to go to Taiwan, and I'm scheduled to go to Hainan Island. And so I contacted this pastor. I said, what do you want me to do? Am I supposed to be there for that extra week to... To come to your church, he says, you come. We'll make a way to do this. He says, no matter what the government says, we're still going to. And that puts me in a really good position to maybe go to prison and preach a little bit there, too. Who knows? <laughs> but in either case, uh, uh, we're, we're planning on a week in Shenzhen, a, a week in Hainan, a Hainan Island, and a week in Taiwan. And in Taiwan, I was there in March and they gave an altar call, and many people came to the Lord. But one that was very important, I gave the altar call, and a 90-year-old man got out of his seat, and he almost ran to the altar. And I thought, a 90-year-old man, his wife was there, and his daughter was on the worship team. I thought, well, what's he doing coming to the altar to give his heart to the Lord? Doesn't make sense to me. Well, he came to the altar, and he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I have been coming to this church with my wife for several years and with my daughter. He said, and I have refused to give my heart to Jesus because I worship my ancestors. He said, but after you preach today, I heard the Spirit of God speak to my heart. And I'm here to give my heart to Jesus and to begin to worship Him. So, you know, 90 years old, think about it. He's lived his life, and there's no telling. I'm, I'm hoping that I'll get to see him. Joe Baba is his name, Joe Baba, Joe Dada. And uh, I'm hoping I'll get to see him again when I go to Taiwan. But if I don't, I can rest assured in the knowledge that I will see him again with the Lord. And I want to tell you here today, before we get into the message, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hear a few things here that's going to shock you, maybe surprise you a little bit. You're going to say, oh, I didn't know that. At least I hope. Now, I know your pastor is a very good uh, pastor, and he's a very good teacher and preacher, so he's probably taught you all of these things. But maybe I've got one or two little things that will be a little nugget that will touch your hearts. And if you're here today and don't know Jesus, do not leave this place without meeting the man that can change your life now and forever. Can you say amen? amen. So uh, we're going to start today with Blood Covenant. And then next Wednesday when I come back, Lord willing, we're going to do a lot more on the Blood Covenant. But what I want to do today, is there, is there a buzz coming from the speakers or what's... Oh, that's from the... Okay, okay. Uh, can you go to the next one? Technically, this is a five-part message. It's not going to be a five-part message. I'm going to try to combine it. But as you can see, there's the cutting of the covenant. There's the old covenant, which we would call the Old Testament. There's the new covenant, which we would call the New Testament. There's the marriage and blood covenant. And listen to me very carefully. Marriage is a covenant. It is not a contract. I'll explain that more next week. The Lord's Supper... Uh, covenant, the baptism and blood covenant. Yes, the Lord's Supper, communion is a covenant. Uh, and so we'll talk about that again uh, either today or next week. Go ahead, please. Now, the Bible says in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I want you to understand something. If we do not understand covenant, now there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians that may not ever have really uh, 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 
met Jesus Christ may not ever have really had an experience with Jesus because when we have an experience with Jesus, our lives change. We're not the person that we used to be. We are completely different. Yes, sometimes it takes time to get to the place where we need to be. In fact, we spend a whole Christian lifetime growing in Christ, learning more and becoming more and more like Jesus. But if you, we have never truly understood covenant, a specifically covenant, then maybe, just possibly, we have never really understood what Christ did for us. And so we, we may use the name Christian, but we may not really have given our hearts to the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are many people who call themselves Christian. Jesus said that there will be, in Matthew chapter 7, He said there will be those that come to Him and that they say, Lord, Lord, haven't we cast out demons in Your name? Haven't we prophesied in Your name? And He says, depart from Me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. He didn't say, no, you didn't do these things. He said, I don't know you. I don't know you. And so we need to understand that there are many who call themselves Christian that have never actually come to know the Christ of Calvary, the risen Christ. They've never actually come to know that Jesus is more than just a concept. He's more than just a, uh, somebody that we pray to when we have a need. He's more than somebody that is a way off yonder in the sweet by and by, but he's real, and he's real today. He's real now. And, and Paul said that you may know Christ, that you may really know him, that he might dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, I have, I have people uh, from other denominations that say, well, Christ doesn't dwell in your hearts. It's wrong to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Really? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's what it says. I, I didn't write that. Paul did. So he, he must have known what he was talking about. Would you go to the next scripture, please? Proverbs 18:24 says these words. It says a man that hath friends must show himself to be uh, must show himself friendly and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Tonight we're going to talk about the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And your first thought is, well that's Jesus. Well, yes, but actually it's your covenant brother, your covenant sister, your covenant partner. Anyone who has, you, you have created a covenant with them, that is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And you'll find out why as we go along here. Uh, go to the next one. It says in Romans 5, 6 through 8, it says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a the good man, some would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love, agape, toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died to make a covenant with us. He did not wait for us to make the covenant with him. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again to make that covenant for us. He chose to do it. Can you say amen? Now, go to the next one for just a second. Yes. And I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to stop here for just a second, and I'm going to read something else. In John 15, 12 through 16. And next week, we're going to talk more about John chapter 15, 16, and 17, because that is the covenant terms of the covenant that we'll talk about next week more. But Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. Remember, we just read, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. There, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now I want you to notice there, there are actually conditions to asking of the Father. Did you know that? 
conditions to asking, asking of the Father. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask what you will. The if-then clause is a very important clause in any contract. It's even more important in a covenant, which is, as I said a moment ago, quite different than a contract. A contract is made to be broken. How many knew that? A contract is made between two people who do not trust each other. That's why you make a contract. You want to make sure that the person you're making a contract does what they say they're not going to do. If they don't do what they say they're going to do, they've broken the contract and you're not bound by it. There are many people that make con uh, contracts that they're hoping, they're really hoping that the other person will break the contract so they won't have to follow through with that contract. That's what many people do in marriage today. They look at the marriage as a contract instead of as a covenant. So therefore, if you don't do everything that I think you should do, if you don't keep all of the promises that you made, then it's bye-bye city. Without even realizing that there is a covenant involved that not only includes the two people, but it also includes God in that covenant. A covenant is made with God. But I, I want to to understand what a covenant is, maybe in a different way than you've looked at in the past. Can anybody think of a more modern example of a covenant? Okay. How about the Declaration of Independence? You say, wait, I don't understand. Well, the Declaration of Independence, go to the next one. Uh, well, well go, go past this, go past this. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Go past it, go past it, go past it. Keep going till you come to, keep going. Next one, go next one, keep going. There, no, next one. Nope, next one. The most famous secular covenant, the most famous secular covenant is the Declaration of Independence. Go to that. The Declaration of Independence was signed by 56 men who all understood that they were committing high treason against the British government when they signed the document. Benjamin Franklin famously highlighted that reality at the time. He said, we must all hang together or, uh, or assuredly we will all hang separately. Now think about that. We must all hang together or assuredly, we will all hang separately. That, that, that's what Benjamin Franklin said. Go to the next page. The concluding sentence of the Declaration states these words. It says, And for the support of this Declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That is what a covenant is. You are pledging to each other everything that you are, everything that you have, everything that you hope to be is the other person's. Now, that works out pretty good if the other person is rich and you're poor. Pastor, can I have your wallet? I'll trade you. Oh, you're not rich either. <laughs> That's a contract. <laughs> the, the whole thing is that uh, the Declaration, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, when they signed this, they knew they were committing treason, according to the British Crown. And if they were caught and captured, they risked death. But the death wouldn't be swift. Um, in fact, it would be by hanging to the point of unconsciousness then being revived, then being disemboweled, and their body parts boiled in oil and their ashes scattered to the winds. Does that sound like something you'd like to commit to your lives, your, your fortunes, and your sacred honor to? They knew that there was quite a possibility this would happen. They valued freedom for themselves and for their posterity, and meaning us, to the extent they, that they found this fate worth the risk. Uh, the story that I'm going to tell you 
is what happened to the men who signed the declaration. Now, when you hear this, I want you to think about all those in our country who are fighting against this country, who would like to destroy this country. I want you to think about what they're doing and how they're doing it and listen to what these people did and see the contrast. Now, I'm not preaching about the U.S. I'm preaching about Jesus, but I'm showing you what a secular covenant is, okay? Five of the signers were captured by the British. There were 56 altogether, okay? Five were captured by the British and brutally tortured as traitors. Nine fought in the war for independence and died from wounds or from hardships that they suffered. Two lost their sons in the Continental Army. Another two had sons captured. At least a dozen of the 56 had their homes pillaged and burned. What kind of men were they? Well, they 25 were lawyers or judges. 11 were merchants. 9 were farmers. Of, uh, and one was a large plantation owner. One was a teacher. One was a musician. One was a printer. These men were men of means. They were educated. Yet they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty could be death if they were captured. So in the face of the advancing British army, um, the Continental Congress fled from Philadelphia to Baltimore on December 12, 1776. It was especially anxious time for John Hancock, the president, as, as his wife, the president of the Continental Congress, and as his wife had just given birth to a baby girl. But because of complications stemming from the trip to Baltimore, the child lived only a few months. William Ellery signing at the risk of his fortune proved only too realistic. In December 1776, during three days of British occupation of Newport, Rhode Island, Ellery's house was burned and all his property was destroyed. Richard Stockton, a New Jersey State Supreme Court justice, had rushed back to his estate near Princeton after signing the Declaration of Independence to find that his wife and children were living like refugees with friends. They had been betrayed by a Tory sympathizer who also revealed Stockton's own whereabouts. British troops pulled him from his bed one night, beat him, and threw him in jail where he almost starved to death. When he was finally released, he went to home to find his estate had been looted, his possessions burned, and his horses stolen. Judge Stockton had been so badly treated in prison that his health was ruined and he died before the war ended. His surviving family had to live the remainder of their lives off of charity from others. Carter Braxton was a wealthy planner and trader. One by one, his ships were captured by the British Navy. He, lo he loaned a large sum of money to the American cause. It was never paid back. He was forced to sell his plantations and mortgage his other properties to pay his debts. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he had to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Continental Congress without pay and kept his family in hiding. Vandals or soldiers or both looted the properties of Clymer, Hall, Harrison, Hopkinson, and Livingston. Seventeen lost everything they owned. Thomas Hayward Jr., Edward Rutledge, and Arthur Middleton, all of South Carolina, were captured by the British uh, during the Charleston campaign in 1780. They were kept in dungeons at the St. Augustine prison until exchanged a year later. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the family home, his family home for his headquarters. Nelson urged General George Washington to open fire on his own home. This was done, and the home was destroyed. Nelson later died bankrupt. Francis Lewis also had his home and properties destroyed. The, French, the British jailed his wife for two months, and that and other hardships from the war so affected her health that she died only two years later. Honest John Hart, a New Jersey farmer, was driven from his wife's bedside when she was near death. Their 13 children fled for their lives. Hart's fields and his gristmill were laid waste. For over a year, he eluded capture by hiding in nearby forests. He never knew where his bed would be the next night, and he often slept in caves. When he finally returned home, he found that his wife had died, his children had disappeared, and his farm stock were completely destroyed. Hart himself died in 1779 without ever seeing his family again. Think about all these things. Such were the stories and sacrifices typical of those who risked everything to sign the Declaration of Independence. 
These men were not wild-eyed, rabble-rousing ruffians. They were soft-spoken men. They were men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more than they valued their own security. They valued liberty more than they valued their own families. They valued liberty more than they valued anything else. Standing tall, straight, and unwavering, they pledged for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. I think those men need a hand for what they did. Can you say amen? Now, did you know all of that? Did you ever think of the Declaration of Independence as being a covenant? And yet that's what it was. These men covenanted together everything they owned. They, they fit, I'm going to be, how, footed, they footed. They footed the bill. Footed? Does that sound right? See, I got it from you. It's catching. They put forward everything they owned to make sure that the army was well equipped, that the army won the battle, that America became the United States of America and became free. Many of them lost families, lives, and so on. Now that is the, 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 um, the epitome of what a uh, covenant really is. It is where you totally agree that you love each other. And this is the first prerequisite. People that say, well, I can get married to somebody and learn to love them. No, that, that's not true. It's not going to, most of the time, it's not going to happen. Love has to be there first. Before you go into a covenant, there has to be love. You understand what I'm saying? God loved us. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God first loved us. It's not that we first loved Him, but He first loved us. And because of His love for us, He pledged Himself. Just like these men that signed the Declaration of Independence pledged themselves, their lives, their fortune, their sacred honor, Jesus Christ pledged Himself for you and for me. Amen? Let's go to the next one. In fact, uh, yeah, go back to the ones that we skipped earlier, if you would, please. Uh, it'll be back several things I want to talk about. Uh, different covenants in the Scriptures. Keep going back. Uh, no, not that far. <laughs> yeah, okay, go back before that, maybe. Yeah, there are many examples of covenants in the Scriptures. For example... Uh, Example, uh, covenants between men, such as uh, Abraham's covenant with Abimelech in, in, in Genesis 21, or Jonathan and David, one of the most, uh, uh, <laughs> the most famous of uh, covenants between men, Jonathan and David in 1 Samuel. Go ahead to the next one. Other covenants <coughs> were between God and men, such as um, God's covenant with Noah in Genesis chapter 9, God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, God's covenant with Isaac in Genesis 26, and God's covenant with Jacob in Genesis 28. Go ahead. The Mosaic covenant uh, during, in, in Exodus 19.24, the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, and the New Covenant, the covenant of the cross of Christ. Uh, these are covenants that the Bible puts forth, and there are other covenants um, um, listed in the Bible. Would you go ahead, please? The covenant relationship was more powerful than the family relationship. In other words, if I had to, just like those men that signed the Declaration of Independence, if I had to leave my family to go take care of my covenant brother, I would take care of him before I would take care of... You say, no, that ain't right. But that is how deep a covenant relationship is. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That is a covenant relationship. And Jesus said, I have called you friends. Which means 
He sticketh closer to us than any brother, any sister, any mother, any father, anybody that we've ever loved and has loved us. He sticketh closer than any and all of them. Can you say amen? Go to the next one, please. Now, I want you to notice this is uh, Abraham. And God, God is showing him what is going to happen. He's showing him uh, uh, the things that will be happening. And you see what they're doing. They're standing in the middle of a blood. What they would do, would they, they would make a ditch and they would cut an animal from the nose all the way back down the spine, all the way and split him in two. They would lay him on either side of that ditch like a little bit of a hilly area. And his blood would run down into the ditch. They would then stand in the blood. This is called cutting the covenant. They would stand in the blood and they would, they would say the covenant terms, which we'll get to in just a moment. And God in the blood showed Abraham things that were going to happen. Things that were going to happen. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Would you go, please? Uh, go ahead, beyond that now. Go beyond that. Yeah, keep going beyond that. We've already, yeah. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 18 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, uh, till, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, I know preachers that only preach from the New Testament. They say we don't need the Old Testament, and yet the Old Testament is uh, 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 just as necessary to us as Christians as the New Testament is. In fact, if we don't understand the Old Testament, we could never understand the New Testament because they're intertwined. Just like if you were to get a ivy growing on your fence and, and it begin to get intertwined. You try to pull it off, it, it don't want to come off there. Well, the New and the Old Testament are intertwined. Um, the Old is in the New. The New is in the Old concealed. The Old is in the New revealed, is the way it said. The New is in the Old concealed. The Old is in the New revealed. And so we need both of these to truly, completely understand the Word of God. The more that we come into an understanding of covenant, the more we're able to come into understanding of what our relationship should be with the Lord, the more we're able to come into an understanding of, of how we can enter into the presence of the Lord the way that was already made for us to do. Amen? Go to the next one, please. So we're going to understand the blood covenant. Go ahead. As I said, they would cut the animal down the nose, all the way down the back. They'd make a ditch. The blood would flow into the ditch, and they would walk in through that blood. Go ahead. The very first thing that they would do, uh, Pastor, would you mind coming here and, and being my, my covenant partner? Now, you all are his witnesses. We're going to get to what that means in just a minute. And you all are my witnesses. You love me, don't you? Say what? He, gave, he got rid of his wallet. <laughs> okay, he don't love me. Somebody else that loves me. <laughs> okay, so what we do, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to exchange our robe. Give me your coat. Mine smells good. Give me your, give me your coat. It's not big enough, is it? I'm going to go swimming in his coat. You say, <laughs> you say, now wait, what, 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 well, yeah, I'm swimming. Is it too tight? I got me a new coat, honey. <laughs> so we exchange robes. Now, you know, the Bible talks about how uh, he has given us a robe of white. He has cleansed us from all our unrighteousness. We used to wear our unrighteousness. It was as filthy rags. Or, yeah, <laughs> it was as filthy rags. But he gave us a coat, his robe, 
that uh, uh, cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Go ahead. Yeah, that's, that, I'm not comfortable in your jacket. It just don't, no, there ain't no money in there. <laughs> Here, honey, quick, hide, hide, hide it, hide it. Ah, uh, stay here, stay here. So they exchanged, they exchanged their robes, and as I said, the main reason is they are giving each other their authority. Now, norm, quite often, the, the um, covenant was done by somebody who was a suzerain or somebody that was like a lord or a king, somebody that was in charge, and he would be the one that would make the terms of the covenant he would be the one that would suggest the covenant. So when he gave you his robe, he was giving you his authority. You understand? Next one. Then they would exchange belts. Now, that doesn't mean this belt. I, most of us, if we took off this belt, our pants wouldn't stay up. That's talking about the belts that carried the weapon. You understand? It's talking about the sword, the axe, whatever weapons you had. That was the belt that carried your weapons. You see it's showing them handing a sword there. That's supposed to be David and Jonathan. Here, this is the best I, I, I... What weapons do I have? Do I have any weapons? Wait, I got a weapon. Here you go. <laughs> so... So they would exchange their belts and they would exchange their weapons. Now the meaning of this, the meaning of this is that with these exchanged, now he was obligated. If y'all wanted to fight me, he had to come and stand with me. Not behind me. He's, a, he's, the, he's the suzerain. He has the army. He's made a covenant with me. Y'all want to come and fight me? you got to fight his army. You know the old saying, you and one army? That's what I'm talking about. Okay? He's got the army. And so the more covenant partners you had, the more armies you had fighting on your side, most people aren't going to come and bother you a whole lot. You understand? So his weapons, him giving me the belt and me giving him the belt, if he goes to war, I'm obligated to go to war with him. If somebody comes to war with me, he's obligated to come and protect me and go to war with me. Go to the next one. The next part was cutting the covenant, and they're standing, as I said, in the blood of the covenant. Go to the next one. Then you, they cut the arm and mix the blood. Now there's a, there's a question. <laughs> it's okay. Put that up there. There's a question about this because the Jews had a law that they were not allowed to cut themselves, okay? Um, but in the, in the Middle East of that time, the way people did, they either cut their arm and drank the blood, and Jews definitely were not allowed to drink blood. That's why they got so upset when Jesus said to them, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no part in me. They didn't like that idea because we're not allowed to do that. It is quite possible that they did do what others did, not as a form of cutting themselves for other gods, but as a form of making a covenant with each other. So we've just cut ourselves, and we're putting our arms together. We're tying our arms together. And at the same time, my blood is flowing into him. His blood is flowing into me. In the blood, there is life. And we are saying to one another, I in you, and you in in me. Sound familiar? Ah, so this is, this is part of the covenant. The hands are strapped together. Go to the next one. And then we walk in this covenant. We stand in the blood. Standing in the blood, we make our promises, not promises. Let me rephrase that. We make the, um, what's the word I want to use? Not pledge. Not vows, although that, that's part of it. Uh, the terms of the covenant, the terms of the covenant. We state the terms of the covenant that cannot be broken. I said a contract you can break. You cannot break a covenant, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Go to the next one. And then we make a scar. The, 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 the 
the cut that we've made here so that our blood could intermingle. We then get some stones and we rub and we rub and we rub so that it makes a scar. Why the scar? Because if enemies come against me, I hold up my arm and they see a scar. And they say, oh, oh, he's got somebody. He's not alone. He's got somebody. Jesus Christ bore the scars for us. His scars are proof that he is there for us. You say amen? Go to the next one. And then, we declare, as I said, we declare the covenant terms. Go to the next one. After declaring the covenant terms, we would eat the memorial meal. Guess what it was? Bread and wine. For the most part, bread and wine. Just like when Melchizedek, who was most likely a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, came to Abraham and he gave him bread and wine to eat. They made a covenant together. Abraham, who only believed in God, paid his tithes to the king of Salem, the king of peace. There's nobody else that I can see that it could be other than Jesus. And he paid him his tithes, and they ate communion together. Would you go to the next one? And the communion meal is to commemorate the fact that we have made this covenant. Now we are brothers. We are covenant brothers. That's closer than any natural-born brother can ever be. And then there's the memorial. They would either uh, build a, you see in the Bible many places, they say build an altar of stones, or they also would plant a tree or something like that. Thank you, brother. Stay right here for a second. Wait, I can't remember what's next, so stay right here. Go to the next one. Okay, go ahead. We'll come back to you in just a minute. So there were five great Bible covenants. Go ahead. God's covenant with Noah was number one. Okay, let's see what that has to say. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Understand that everything that I'm talking about has to do with faith. All covenant has to do with faith. I have to, if I'm making a covenant with him, I have to have total faith in him. In other words, if I'm going to give him my wallet, that means give him my my debit card, that means I also got to give him the PIN number for my debit card. I better really love this man. I better really have faith in him. Otherwise, if there is any money in there, it's bye-bye birdie. It's gone. You don't do this with somebody you just meet today and you're going to be blood covenant partners with them tomorrow. No, it don't work that way. This is a true, loving, caring relationship to where you're never going to turn your back on each other. You're always going to be there for each other. And so Noah, was uh, by faith, he was divinely warned of things that he couldn't even see. He couldn't even understand. Who had ever heard of, of what God told him was going to happen on the earth? But he had faith. And because of his faith, he became an heir of righteousness. Go to the next one. In 2 Peter 2.5, it says, God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. How many know we're living in a very ungodly world today? God promised Noah a sign, and go to the next, uh, next picture there. Every time we see a rainbow today, we're reminded of that agreement. This covenant has not been done away with. God has not destroyed the world again. It's not been done away with. As long as God still sends a rainbow after a storm, we always remember God's covenant with Noah. Go to the next one. Now, somebody said, well, now, wait a minute. The rainbow has nothing to do with God. I know what the Bible says, but the rainbow is only uh, the, 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 the... Mist in the air and the sun shining through it and it's refracted like, yes, yes, yes. But you have to understand, before Noah's time, there had never been a rainbow. There had never been a, there was no sun shining through. There was only clouds and it wasn't until the clouds broke loose and sent forth the rain, the very first rain. Before that, the land was watered from a mist coming up from the ground. 
when the clouds broke through, sent forth the very first rain, then, then the rainbow, the very first rainbow appeared at the end of that. And that was God's sign to Noah saying, it'll never happen again. Now, I want to tell you about a rainbow, the most special. How many have ever seen a really special rainbow? Like my wife and I were driving through the Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs, and we saw a double rainbow. Anybody ever seen a double rainbow? Man, they're nice. Let me tell you one that maybe you've seen, but I would say most people hadn't, because I've only seen one in 50 years. I was in China teaching in the school, and it was so cloudy. I came out from one of the classrooms, and it was so cloudy, and off in the distance there was a tiny little arc of a rainbow in the distance, uh, where the sun was peeking through the clouds, and there was the rainbow, just like this one up in the sky, but it was much, much smaller, and it was like really far up there, just a little arc. And I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And I went into my next class, and I began to teach class, and I came out, and all the clouds had disappeared. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. There was no rain. There was no water. The sun was directly overhead, and around the sun completely around the sun, right above my school, was a rainbow. I've never seen, anybody ever seen one of those before? It was completely around the school. It was like God was saying, I put you here in this place. I'm going to bless. And literally thousands of my students over the years gave their hearts to the Lord. I really believe that it was God's blessing. Can you say amen? And so God gave Noah, this is a sign. Go ahead to the next one. Then there's the Abrahamic covenant. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> How did I get that picture twice? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so we're going to read Genesis chapter 15. I'm going to read through it because there might be a few things in here that you've missed. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Remember, we just said that I would give my belt to him, my, my weapons belt, and he would give me his weapons belt. He's telling me that he is my shield. He's also my great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. In other words, one who was born in my house has to be my heir if I have no seed. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Go to the next. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. Listen to the terms of the covenant that God made with Abram. If thou be able to number them, and he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each one, each piece, one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. Now I want you to notice here, Abraham, he thought he had to help God. He's driving away the birds that are coming down on the carcasses. He's driving them away thinking that he had to help God, but God didn't need his help. And God made a deep sleep to fall on Abraham. And in fact, there was such a terror of the darkness. It was so dark that he was actually afraid. Uh, of the darkness. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land. Now listen, God made many promises to Abram, but most people don't realize that long before Egypt came along, God told Abraham what was going to happen. He told him before his son, was, uh, 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 Isaac, was even born, he told him what was going to happen so that he would be prepared. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for four hundred years. Go ahead. Hello. 
Oh, we're there. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with a great substance. And sh thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, and that would have been fourth generation, 280 years, but uh, actually it's 400 years at that time. In the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Now I told you that a covenant is usually made between two people, that you have to have two people to make the covenant. But in this case, God did not tell Abraham to come in there and walk in the midst of that sacrifice with him. God himself walked in the midst of that sacrifice. God himself made a covenant with himself. That's an unbreakable covenant. The things that he promised Abraham in this chapter that we just read were unbreakable. God made the promise. God would fulfill it. He would keep his word. Why? Because he's God and he does not lie. He's not a man that he should lie. Can you say amen? Go to the next one. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Go ahead. Abraham did not initiate this covenant. God in his own sovereignty initiated. Go to the next one. In verse 1, God said to Abraham, I am your shield and your great reward. Go ahead. And it, it, then, it then says, Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted for righteousness. Go ahead. And then this was not only a covenant between Abraham and God. It was a covenant between God and himself. God was saying, no matter what happens, I will do this. My will be done. How do we pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, my goodness, God was saying, my will will be done. Go ahead. This means that God was making a unilateral decision. No matter what else happened, God would keep his promise to Abraham. No matter what else happened, he had made a promise, he would keep it. Go ahead. For when God made the promise to Abraham, because he could not swear on any greater, according to Hebrews 6.13, he swear by himself. You know... How many people have said, now we're not supposed to say that, but how many people have said, I swear to God, over your, in your lifetime? You said, I swear to God. You're not supposed to say that, by the way. But I'm sure in your lifetime, most people have said that at one time or another. Well, God swore to God. There was nobody higher than him. There was nobody else he could swear to. There was only one name that he could swear to. That was his own. Go ahead. God walked this covenant himself. Okay, go ahead. And then there's the Mosaic covenant, and I'm going to finish here in just a few minutes. The Mosaic covenant, and we're just going to go through this very quickly. Go to the next one. In Exodus 2.24, it says, So God heard their groaning. He had just told Abraham 400 years before, this is what's going to happen. They're going to be in, in bondage in another country. Now they've been in bondage, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob, and go ahead. And then he sent Moses to deliver them. And then after Moses, there was the Davidic co covenant. You know, there was old David killing Goliath. David killing Goliath. I don't know if that's the exact uh, size of them, but that, that looks pretty big to me. I wouldn't want to go up against. You know, my father-in-law is almost that big. It almost made me not get married. I was scared of him. I got a friend of mine, I got a friend of mine, his daughter brought home her very first boyfriend. She was 16 years old. Girls, you're not allowed to have a boyfriend until you're 40. But she was 16 years old. She brought home her very first birth boyfriend. You know what the dad did? He reached out to shake his hand. And instead of getting his hand, he grabbed him by the neck. He picked him up. He threw him down on the couch got on top of him and said, I want to know what your intentions are with my daughter. 
They're married today. He was a good boy. <laughs> They're married today. He went to West Point and became an officer. They're married today. He wasn't going to dare. I mean, her dad was a big guy. I want to know what your intentions are with my daughter. Okay, then. The Davidic covenant. Go ahead. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, 12, 13 says, And when the day, thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God made this promise to David. Solomon then went and built the house. Jesus then, many, many years later, came at, born of a virgin, did just exactly what God said that would happen. God established the throne of David through Jesus forever. Of his kingdom there is no end. Say praise God. Praise God. Go to the next one. The covenant agrees, according to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, uh, the covenant agreement reached its fulfillment when Jesus, a descendant of the line of David, was born in Bethlehem. The Gospel of Matthew starts off by showing Christ was the son of David. Okay, next. And then there's the covenant of the cross of Christ. We're going to stop there. But next week I'm going to show you how all of the covenants from the Old Testament fit together with the covenant of the cross of Christ. And we're going to go into John chapter 15, John chapter 16, and John chapter 17. And we're going to get a completely new understanding of the things that Jesus said. For example, why did Jesus said when he said, uh, I call you friend, now you know. He called you friend because there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. But there are other things in John 15, 16, and 17 that also relate to covenant. We'll talk about those next week. I would like to talk to you right now because I, I don't dare ever. I love your pastor, but I don't dare give the service back to him until I first find out if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, my goodness, you have no idea what you're missing. I'm telling you, there is no life other than the life that Jesus provides. He has promised us to give us true life and to give us that more abundantly. And when we begin to understand covenant relationships and we make a covenant with Jesus in our hearts, a covenant that He's already prepared for us, already made for us, and we accept that covenant as part of our lives, and accept Jesus as part of our lives. Accept Him as our covenant brother. He forgives us of our sins. He changes our lives. He turns us into that which is good for His purpose, for His kingdom, in this world, and forever. Would you bow your heads, please? Father God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that we've had the chance tonight to talk a little bit about covenant. And we ask, Lord, that even as we've learned a little bit about covenant tonight, Lord, that if there be anyone here this night that does not know you, that has never, never given their heart to you, that has never understood, that has maybe their first time here or maybe they've been here a hundred times, but they've never understood, they've never really understood what it means to be in a covenant relationship with you. And Lord, this night they really want to have that kind of relationship where uh, 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 you are fighting their battles and they're there to do your will. Lord, that you are here this night. Right now, you are here. Your spirit is here moving in amongst and about, about through the people. Lord, anyone that is here that doesn't know you, touch their heart even now. Cause them to long to know you, Lord, so that they might give their lives to you and that they might become a new person in you. In Jesus' name we pray. If there is anyone here, every head bowed, every eye closed, anyone here, you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, but tonight you're beginning to understand a little bit, and you want Jesus to save you. You want Jesus to forgive you. You want Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You want Him to come into your heart and into your life and make you anew. Then I want you to raise your hand, and I'm going to pray with you. And Jesus is going to save you, and He's going to change your life. Are you here tonight? You've never given your heart to the Lord. Never given your heart to the Lord, but tonight... You want to do that. Is there one? Hallelujah. 
Okay, now remember, next Wednesday we're going to have a, another Bible study on this. It's going to go a little bit deeper than what we did tonight. I want you to bring others who don't know Jesus. I promise you that Jesus is going to touch them and their lives are going to change. I promise you Jesus is going to touch them and their lives are going to change. Bring others next Wednesday. But for now, I want to talk to those who, who are here. All, everyone, no one raised their hand, so I'm assuming everyone is a Christian. Fine, that's good, but let me ask you a question. What kind of a relationship have you had with the Lord? Have you had a relationship that's on again, off again? Or have you had a relationship that's been built upon a contract that you think is breakable anytime you feel like breaking it? Or have you had a relationship that has really been a covenant relationship that you know that you know that you know that you know that Jesus is your Lord and you're serving Him and you're, you're, you're living for Him every day of your life. If you haven't had that kind of covenant relationship to where you hold on to His nail-scarred hands and you follow Him wherever He may lead, if you haven't had that close relationship, if you haven't really been in His presence and you know you need to be in His presence and you want to be more in His presence and have more of that relationship today, I want you to raise your hand and I'm going to pray with you and God's going to touch you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Covenant.